Good evening. Thank you for joining us here at Travis Baptist Church for our midweek Bible study. This is January the 6th, 2021. And yes, it is our first midweek Bible study of the new year. And we are glad you've chosen to join us. We've taken the last couple of weeks off due to the holidays and due to my schedule, not really being able to have the time to do this. But we are back on track now. Um, we do want to let you know Travis Baptist Church here in Corpus Christi, Texas. We are located on Weber Road across from the HEB, just off the intersection of Weber and Holly. We have services on Sunday morning, Bible study at 9.30 a.m., worship at 10.45. You are free to join us. Um, and uh, we are trying to get back into the swing of things after going through our Christmas and holiday time and, of course, our COVID time, which still looms over us. Well, keep praying. Keep praying that, that God will make 2021 much, much better than 2020 was in many ways. We also want to ask you to pray for a few folks, um, especially the Johnson family. Doris and Noble Johnson were longtime members of our church. Uh, Mr. Johnson passed away a few years ago. Doris turned 100 back in September. Some of us sent cards to her, and she passed away on New Year's Eve. I just got the news today. So pray for her family and celebrate that God gave her a century here on earth. Um, and uh, then also um, many of us prayed for Miss Sally's uh, great-grandson, Tucker. He had a, somehow or other, his stomach was kind of twisted inside of him. He's two years old. Last night he had surgery at Driscoll Children's. He's doing really well. Thank you for praying for him. And we have others who we are waiting to hear test results on and plans for uh, diagnosis and healing. And so let's remember them in prayer also. Also, today uh, they are voting in Georgia for the last two Senate spots. We want to pray for God's peace and God's wisdom. We want to accept that God is in charge and not to go into panic state no matter how this thing turns out. Let us remember um, that God is there during regime changes. God sometimes uses governments to chastise or bless his people. And uh, uh, let's just stay on our knees and praying for those in leadership of our country, of our state, of our city and county. And remembering all that, let's start praying. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for the new opportunity of the new year. We pray, God, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, we are grateful that that will includes the healing of young Tucker and the surgery he had last night. We are praying that that will includes the healing of some of our members who are having uh, cancer diagnosis, waiting treatment plans. And God, that you're, you would bless them, that you would heal them. We're praying for your will to be done with the voting in Georgia with the ultimately the directions of this country and even if that direction that you have deemed what we need is not what I would like so be it Lord because when we pray not our will but thine we don't have the right to come back and say that you can only work like this and we should never say you're losing so Lord we we pray that you grab victory that it be in a way that glorifies you the most. And if that makes it hard on your people, we're okay with that because we know you have not abandoned us nor forsaken us. So we pray for these things, Lord. We pray that your truth will prevail. We pray that your people will lift up your gospel, your son, that he will shine brightly, that people will behold our good works and glorify you in heaven. Praying for these things for our church, that you would bless us greatly and give us a great year coming up. Help us, Lord, as we try to lead souls to you during the coming year, that they will grow, that they will prosper, that they will multiply. Be lifted up, Lord. We say these things in the name of your precious Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, if you will remember, we began, a, well, about the time the holidays hit us, uh, kind of a new series on our midweek study. We're kind of looking at death, the last enemy. Um, kind of based off of a book I've been reading by Michael Whitmer entitled The Last Enemy. And um, I, I'm finding this kind of a, a really good thing for myself right now. We are facing so much, and I guess I could have included this in Prairie Quest, but just in the last 
couple of weeks here, excuse me, <coughs> two good friends of mine. Um, one, a guy I went to college with oh so long ago back in Arkansas named Randy, Randy Shinrock, um, had been diagnosed with COVID. He's been in the hospital for a couple weeks now, and we really want to pray for him. Michael Moore was another uh, guy about my age. We used to pastor in the same association uh, in the Anderson County area of Texas. And Michael, you know, posted last week on uh, on Facebook you know, uh, they're they're transferring me to another hospital. And then the next thing we saw, they, they gave a couple scans on my legs. He'd been battling COVID also. They scanned his legs and said he had some blood clots there. And that was like Thursday or Friday. Got the news on Sunday um, that Michael had passed away. And just that suddenly, that quickly. Um, Randy, in one instance, we think he's going to get better. We're praying that he does. And when it's somebody you grew up with, or at least, you know, when you knew them, you guys were young, you know, when we first met. And we had the world in front of us. And then to sit there and go, we're at the same age, and I'm doing fine, and he's battling for his life. Um, that's an eye-opener. And then, of course, Michael. Yeah, you were sick. Gosh, you're in the hospital. You've been in the hospital about 15, 20 days now, haven't you? And then he posts one day, and, oh, man, I hope those clots clear up. And the next thing we hear, it is like that. Death carries a fear for us. Death carries a, a, a chill, you know, because it could be us at any moment. If there's anything else this virus has done, it has equalized us a great bit. We have battled through people thinking it's not that bad. Yes, it has a 99% survival rate. But some of us got friends in that 1%. And that can open your eyes up a little bit. As we consider death and its... And it's and the fear that comes with it, the, the, the grief that comes with it, the shock, all of these things, the collateral damage that this is doing to us, um, trying to keep our focus, trying to stay positive, at the same time wanting to weep with those who are weeping right now. And whenever we mention weeping in terms of death, we come back to our Lord Jesus. And we see in John chapter 11, Jesus dealing with the death of a personal friend. Maybe you've been dealing with one. I mentioned Miss Doris. I, I've met her one time, but she's got a daughter and a son-in-law who have been really good friends to this church. They, they don't live here, but they have supported us in great ways in honor of the way their parents served this church for over 50 years. Um, we lose people we loved, and suddenly they're not there anymore. And Jesus um, had a good friend named Lazarus. Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha, and when Lazarus suddenly died, well, first Lazarus got sick. And they sent word to Jesus. And Jesus said, you know, this guy's illness is not unto death, but it's that God would be glorified. So what did Jesus do? Instead of rushing right over there, he spends a couple more days. And then he gets over to where Lazarus is. And the first thing the ladies tell Jesus when he gets there is, Lord, if you had been here, our brother wouldn't have died. Well, Jesus gives that wonderful speech to them about him being the resurrection and the life. That when death comes, we can depend on him. And we come down, um, we're going to read the Gospel of John, chapter 11. And we're going to read verses 33 to 36. And I want to talk about what happens with Jesus here. John, chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Um... And Jesus has been talking to Mary and Martha, Martha and telling them, look, I'm the resurrection and the life. So let's go on up to the tomb. And they head out there. And when they get there, um, verse 33. Therefore, when Jesus saw her, and that was Lazarus' sister Martha, when he saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. Now, we all owe a great debt to a man named D.A. Carson, Dr. Donald Carson. He's got a commentary on John that is just excellent on this passage. We've often wondered, you know, um, all this weeping going on. Jesus says to them, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And when they got there, it says in verse 35, that verse we all like to memorize, Jesus wept. 
Now, I just mentioned Dr. Carson. All right, this is where his commentary kicks in at. Why did Jesus cry? Well, we know he cared about Lazarus. He cared about Mary and Martha. Sympathizing, empathizing. They had lost their brother. Probably the main source of income for their family. Um, and But Dr. Carson brings out something else. And we go back up to verse 33. Um, it says there, you know, when... She was weeping. He saw her weeping. And then there were the Jews who came with her weeping. Now, there was a tradition back then. Um, you could actually have, and dig this, you could actually have professional mourners come during your time of grief. These are the people that, man, you know, sometimes you're in shock and maybe your tears come quietly or not at all. Sometimes you go into full survival mode. Man, I've got to protect my family, my loved ones. And you show no emotion at all because you're the, the one they got to lean on right now. And you can't afford to show emotion. But here come the professional mourners. And they will weep and howl and wail and make sure everybody knows how sorrowful you really are. Um, this was helpful for them. Because uh, for some reason, I guess in terms of maybe you're not ready to let it all out. Maybe you're not there yet in your process of grief. But there they are expressing that grief publicly so that everybody knows, yes, this family has experienced loss. But it says Jesus groaned in the spirit and was troubled. It wasn't so much a word groan, meaning Jesus is going, poor old Mary and Martha. Uh, Dr. Carson, his commentary points out, this groaning here is often tied in with suppressed anger maybe. The idea of deep emotion, not just sadness, but he's upset. Remember, we're calling this series um, The Last Enemy. Death is the last enemy. And who is death's? You know, death is our greatest enemy because we live in mortality fearing its consequences. Death's biggest enemy is Jesus. Because Jesus has in his power to destroy death. And he did when he went to that cross and came out of the grave. And it's like death and Jesus were constantly ready to fight. Ready to brawl. Ready to go at it. Dr. Carson points out in his commentary. That as Jesus groans and experiences that strong emotion. Anger if you will. Um, it is anger at death. It is... You know, we as Christians, we've been dominated by it. There's a passage over in uh, Hebrews chapter 2 that I've mentioned the first several times in this series. That we have grown up living in the fear of death. And he came, Jesus came to free, free us from that. Because Jesus hates how death dominates and how death brings despair in our lives. Jesus hates what death does to us and the chaos it brings. Uh, long ago, I, I remember a, a prominent pastor in Little Rock, Arkansas, a guy named uh, Vaught was his last name, W.O. Vaught. And he had a fairly popular sermon among the circle I ran around with that the reason Jesus wept was he was sad that he would have to bring Lazarus back down from heaven. Maybe so. But as the other commentator, Dr. Carson, points out, this is strong, somewhat angry emotion expressed when he groans and is troubled it's not just that he doesn't want to bring him back to life. I think Jesus, as is pointed out, is angry, irate. The, the, the sorrow that death brings to God's people and the, the, the chaos that's caused. I mean, let's face it. A good Christian, a godly person, someone who's been faithful and suddenly... A child dies, their spouse dies, their parent dies. Something awful has happened in their life. I mean, they are, let's face it, they're no good for a while. They are living in chaos. They are living, man, what, I don't know what just hit me. I don't know how to handle this. I don't know how I'm going to cope. We're trying to be strong, but I got nothing right now. And I think Jesus is angry, irate, sorrowful, all of those emotions because of the chaos and the, the, the sorrow that is brought into the lives of his people. And, and you know we talk a lot about the stages of grief. And what those stages do to us. Because um, sometimes 
maybe more often we want to admit, that sorrow and that helplessness degenerates into despair and even unbelief. Think about it. How often do we know of someone that's lost someone and, I mean, they're mad at God. And that's okay if you're mad at God. He can take it. Uh, I think in the Psalms, we will find many times in the Psalms, they are frustrated with God. They're angry with God. They are despairing. And, and I don't think the Lord enjoys that we go through that. It's part of the curse that sin has brought, that death reigns over us. And death brings such sorrow unto the point of despair. Now let's remember, First Thessalonians 4.13 says, you know, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who fall fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. You know, that verse 13 kicks off that famous passage about what we like to call the rapture. But let's look at that phrase. The Lord doesn't want us sorrowing as those who have no hope. But boy, it is hard in that initial impact of the loss. Hopelessness sets in very easily. Despair. And then when that despair comes in, God, did you even care? Do you even love us anymore? Unbelief. Hopelessness. Jesus is angry at that kind of stuff. Not so much as anger at those of us who are feeling those feelings, which are perfectly normal in this fallen world we live in. But the fact that we're living in a fallen world and that's what it's doing to us. He's got us in the palm of His hand. He is holding on to us. If you are struggling with God's love for you, I want to invite you to be with us this Sunday, January 10th, here at Travis, 10.45 a.m. We're going to be talking about that very issue. Um, as we have struggled through hard times of hanging on to how God really feels about us. Come and join us for that. But for right now and right here, we want to focus on this. You know, grief can quickly degenerate into despair. Um, Jesus, that makes him weep. And... Even to the point where we're even questioning whether God is good, whether Jesus is good. He gets frustrated with us and he's very frustrated with the circumstances we live under. Death strikes a big blow. Jesus weeps, first off, because his friends are hurting. They're hurting at what death has caused. He weeps with them. But I think he also weeps at the bigger picture because he is God. And let us face it, you know, sometimes we get the picture that God must enjoy squishing us like bugs. God must enjoy throwing us into chaos and tribulation. God must enjoy yanking that rug out from under us. Because face it, for some of us it happens so often. But Jesus weeps at the sinful conditions at which we must live under. I think as a man, Jesus, who is God, but also is a man. He is 100% God. He is 100% human. And those human feelings, and that human reality striking him as he is here on earth living among us as one of us. Not a high priest who doesn't know what regular life is like. There he is experiencing death with the rest of us. The death of a loved one and later on his own death. And he weeps. To let us know it is an awful thing. In fact, it makes him so angry he could cry that we have to live like this. But there's coming a day where we won't have to. And maybe, you know, that day is coming, bringing us to tears in that hope that someday death truly will no longer be an enemy. Jesus weeps because of our despair. And everyone, you know, when we're down here on earth, we start thinking, what good does my faith do? It looks like death is one. The devil is one. Where is Jesus? Grandma's gone. My wife is gone. My baby is gone. All this awfulness around it. Those feelings come rising up. And Jesus weeps that we have to go through them. But one day in that grief, we look up and he's still there. Earlier, he said to Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he perish, he shall live. Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Those were his words. 
Who he that believes in me and dies, yet shall he live. He that believes in me shall ne- and lives shall never die. And then he asks that question, do you believe this? It's the only thing that can pr- pull us out of our weeping. Is to believe that. Jesus goes on here. Verse 34. Let me see where you've laid him. They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then verse 36. And those professional mourners, the Jews, and some others hanging around said, Look how he loved them. And he did. Jesus had a lot bigger things on his mind. He's the son of God. He's going to be the savior of the world. He's going to go die on a cross. He created the world. He knows the hair on everybody's head. He is God in the flesh. He keeps this universe held together. The reason our planet doesn't go flying out of orbit is it tells us in the Bible that by him all things were made that were made and all things are held together. Jesus got bigger problems than Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, doesn't he? Well, no. Because he comes back down to the individual level and reaches out to them. Behold how he loved them. And so as we look and we see what's going on here, as Christ ministers to these people by weeping with them, see how he loved them. And then some of them, there's that doubt, there's that unbelief, there's that that pain working in. You know, he could have stopped this. Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Yeah, he could. Let's finish the story. Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. And they're all going, Lord, he's been in there four days. Surely he stinketh. But Lazarus comes out. Jesus has raised him from the dead. Dead four days. But today we want to focus on that emotional support we get from Jesus. He weeps with us in our pain and weeps for the bigger thing of that we have to live with this kind of thing. Take comfort that your Lord loves you like this. Take comfort that even in the darkest moment He weeps with you and then He'll raise you up. Resurrection is our hope. Eternal life is the promise we hang on to. So yes, because of that, we do not grieve like others grieve. We know we will be raised with Him. But we still grieve. And thanks be to the Lord. He doesn't let us grieve alone. Even in it, as dark as it may feel, He is there. Hang on to that. As you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Let's pray together. Thank you Lord. That you are there. When I lost my mother. When I lost my father. When we lost our nephew. You are there when we lost Miss Doris. When we lost Peter. When we lost Jean. When we lost friends of ours. You were there. You wept with us. And you gave us hope. You gave us strength. You're a good God. Even when in our pain and in our sorrow we can't see that or feel that. Maybe it's somewhere in the back of our head. But right in that moment the pain rises to the top and says where are you? Like Elijah who couldn't find you in the earthquake. Who couldn't find you in the raging fire. And as we grieve, we're looking and we can't find you. But then we hear that still, small voice in all of our pain. Thank you, Lord. Brace us for those losses that are coming. 2020 hit us like a Mack truck. God, please, make 21 better. And give us hearts that are strong. Minds that are focused. Filled with praise for you. And the wisdom that comes from your word. Bless those that are hearing this message. Comfort them in their trouble and their struggles. And we ask all these things. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, if you're struggling with some of this. We want to invite you if you feel up to it. To come and join us on Sunday. We have live service. 
We do Sunday school at 930, worship at 1045 at Travis Baptist Church, Weber Road across from the HEB in Schlotsky's and Bank America, 5802 Weber if you're from out of town. And then um, uh, also check us out if you don't want to come to a live service. We post our services every Sunday afternoon. Check this Facebook page out or this YouTube channel. Come to our uh, Facebook page here at Travis Baptist Church, facebook.com, Travis Baptist Church. Um, look for us there. Our website, Travis, www.travisbaptist.org. Um, we also post our messages there uh, in an MP3 audio format. So uh, come look for us. Uh, if you don't can't attend live, we are there at those places. Church website, travisbaptist.org, and search Travis Baptist Church, Corpus Christi, Texas, on Facebook. We're there also, all right, with links to our YouTube and other such fun things, okay? May God bless you, and we hope to see you soon.